We want to welcome you to another edition of God's Living Word, a program brought to you by First Presbyterian Church of Greenville, Ohio. First Presbyterian is located in historic downtown Greenville at 114 East 4th Street. We can be reached by phone at 937-548-3188. We hope as a result of this service that you will find that our message is uplifting and meaningful to help you in your daily walk in spiritual life as a Christian. Throughout the week, we have several ministries that I know will be of help to you. Wednesdays in particular, there are several Bible studies for both adults as well as children. Our Logos ministry is for children preschool through fifth grade. We have Jam, Jesus and Me for junior highs, and then our senior high ministry Wednesday evening. If you do not have a church home, we invite you to participate and be involved in our worshiping community, whether on the airwaves or certainly personally in the congregation. At this time, we'd like to invite you to be part of our family of faith here at First Presbyterian as we worship the Lord and listen to God's living word. On the screen and printed in your bulletin, and one of the prophecies, of course, is the fact that the Messiah is the coming stump of Jesse. And so let us keep that in mind as we begin. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From the, of branch, will bear fruit. the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. Let us worship him in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join together in our opening praise this morning as we sing, Lo, how a rose air blooming. Let's join together. first Advent candle is the Prophecy Candle, which Carson Henry lit for us today. And it reminds us of all of those age-old prophecies that God included in the Holy Scripture hundreds and hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. And today, we acknowledge those prophecies as well as their fulfillments. Amen. Let us pray our prayer of confession. Our loving God, God of mercy and of grace, you know the secrets of our hearts, how blind we are to our own faults, yet harsh in judging others. How proud we are of our success, yet grudging in our praise of others. In your tender care and unfailing love on this first Sunday of Advent, forgive our conform conformity to the world's ways. By your transforming grace, make us open to your wisdom and your ways. 
Hear now our silent and personal confession. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. to show you this picture of a dog. This dog has a treat on his nose. And he's sitting there patiently waiting, waiting, waiting until his master says, okay, you can eat it. And he'll flip it up in the air and he'll grab it and he'll just dance around and feel so good about that treat. Now, we're going to be talking today about Advent. And Advent, it means the coming and i want you guys to follow me and we're going to go over here to the uh, to the advent wreath come on come over here this way okay i want you to look at this advent wreath and do you see the greenery that goes around it has no beginning it has no end that represents god's love it has no beginning, has no end. He loves us forever. And the evergreen is always green. It's always there. And the candles there mean um, love, hope, peace, and joy. And uh, this is the prophecy candle. And this is where back uh, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born, it was predicted in the Old Testament that he would be born. And we get so excited because every week we light a candle and we're getting closer to Christmas. Don't you get excited at Christmas? Don't you get, oh, you like those presents? Oh, it's so exciting. But we're celebrating the birth of Jesus. And next week we'll light another candle and another candle. And finally, the Christ candle, the white one in the center. That's the one that represents his birth. And we, when we, that comes, that's when Christmas is here. So we want to feel excited. You, we want to know that it's Jesus' birth that we're celebrating, but we get presents, don't we? Okay. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing Jesus into our lives and that he gave his life for us. Amen. Amen. Very good. Thank you. We are going to have Ethan and Isabel hang the Advent wreaths. And remember what Mrs. Henninger said? The round stands for God's love. And Ethan, I'm going to have you take that and we'll have you place this over on this hook, and Mrs. Henninger will help. And Isabel, I'm going to have you come with me. And the green stands for Christ and his love for each of us. And would you take that and put it on the hook here? There we go. All right. You've decked the halls. <laughs> All right. Now, we're going to be singing, come thou long expected Jesus. 
And you can go back to your class or to with your parents, okay? We're going to be singing now. Again, we want to welcome you to this service of worship this morning, and we're especially glad if anyone is visiting with us this morning. We're glad that you are here. For the visitors, there are welcome packets at the back of church, and you're encouraged to take one when you leave. Also at the end of the pews is our friendship register. If you would write your name and pass it down the pew, we would appreciate that. Following today's service, there will be a celebration of ministry carry-in meal in honor of Nikki Gilmore's service in the social hall, and there's lots of food, so we encourage everyone to stay. And I want to thank Nikki. I'm, I don't think she's here in the sanctuary, right? She's back with the kids. Okay, she's back with the kids. But I want to thank Nikki for her seven and a half years of service here at our church and for all the lives especially our youth that she has touched and I know she will continue to, to touch and we just want to thank her for that, for her service. Thank you. Um, during the meal today there will be um, Christmas greeting cards on the table and there's pens and please fill out one um, for both of our servicemen that are affiliated with our church, Alex Thomas, the son of Ran uh, Jane and Randy Tester, and Isaac Klein, the grandson of Bill and Polly Klein. Please put the name of the recipient on the outside of the card, and then it's going to be picked up today and will be delivered to them so that they can get them before Christmas. Also, we're having our church bazaar. We're having it um, this Sunday and the following two Sundays for um, homemade crafts, baked goods, any sorts of things that are going to be for sale back there right after church today. Um, the middle school tutoring will begin on Wednesday, January the 10th, and tutoring will take place each Wednesday through the 1st of May, and we will mostly tutor 6th grade students each week from 2.30 to 3.30, and anyone interested in this ministry should contact Diane Amick. Next Sunday, we will have our annual congregational caroling party. Carolers are asked to sign up on the bulletin insert and put in the offering box at the rear of church. And they're going to be meeting here at 5 p.m. next Sunday, and then there's going to be a party to follow at Dick and Diane Brown's. Also, there's an insert in the bulletin. Um, tomorrow, Monday, from 6 to 9 p.m., there's a community fundraiser at Bob Evans, and it's going to benefit the Dark County Community Bell Ringing Project. So it looks like Bob Evans is going to donate 15% of your check when you present this flyer at checkout at the Greenville location. Okay. There are other announcements in the bulletin, so please take a note of them. And also we want to remind the congregation that there's offering boxes located in the rear of the church um, where you can place your tithes and offerings either when you come in or when you leave. And we want to thank the congregation for their continued faithful giving to the church. At this time, we want to lift up a prayer of dedication for our tithes and offerings. Gracious God, you have given us so much creation, our minds and lives, even eternal life through your son, Jesus Christ. As you have given to us, we want to give back as a sign and symbol of our love for you and what you mean to us. 
Utilize these offerings now so that your kingdom will flourish and your name praised. For we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, I want to invite Alex Berry forward to do our scripture reading. Isaiah seven thirteen through 14. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David. It is too little for you to weary mortals, that you weary my God also. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.
I invite you to take your blue pew Bible, if you will, and turn to page 1 in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. As we read this passage responsively, and I invite you to stand as we do so. <clears throat> Let us hear the word of the Lord. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. You may be seated. Let's just take a moment for a word of prayer. Our loving and gracious Lord Jesus, we thank and praise you for this passage of Scripture, an age-old prophecy that has current and relevant meaning for our lives today. So bring home that message. Challenge and comfort us, empower us to be your children. For we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hope is something we all need and want. Wouldn't you agree? Especially in the time in which we are living today, how we need that sense of hope. And yet, I have to be reminded that every time I go to the news channel and turn it on, there's a little bit of a shudder of fear as to what that breaking news is going to be all about. You know, whether if it has to do with North Korea and the threat of nuclear ambition on the part of that country, and as you know, if you've been following the news, they now have a ballistic missile that can go over the ocean and hit any point possible in the United States. Or if it has to do with ISIS. And it's not so much a concern about that which is taking place in the Mideast, but what they can do in Europe and what they can do in the United States that gives us cause to wonder or whether it has to do with what's been front and center the last couple of weeks, and that has to do with sexual misconduct in the workplace. And icons from across various industries have come down, and rightfully so, as women have stood up and spoken out. And that is a good thing. But it all creates a shroud a cloud of darkness that comes across our world and culture today. And it seems wherever we turn, we can't get away from it. And it's understandable as we think about what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden, taking that little apple, that innocent little apple, and brought it to their lips. There is a sense of darkness that has come over the face of this earth. And it causes us to say, where is our hope? Are we going to find our hope in our own ingenuity and in our own cleverness? Or are we going to find our hope in something far different? The reason we let the candle today the reason that Alex put the Christ child in the crash. Jesus, the Christ, the hope of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But the question is, will we choose that as our hope? That is the question. You see, 
In our Old Testament reading, and I invite you to take out your Blue Pew Bible and turn to page 636, there was another shroud of darkness and a cloud hanging over King Ahaz, king of Judah. And there was a dilemma that was brewing. And the dilemma was this. The king of Israel and the king of Syria were threatening Ahaz in Judah to undermine his reign, to undermine the people of Judah, to overtake them. And he didn't know what to do. Either he could trust God or he could trust someone who is far more visible, and that was the king of Assyria. And you see, Ahaz had to wrap his head around this, and he chose Assyria. And all the while, it's as if God is standing on a platform of boxes, waving his arms, saying, Ahaz, Ahaz, I am here. Don't forget me. I can make a difference in your life. Notice in verse 10 and 11 of our text. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. And did you catch that pronoun? Your God? God is saying to Ahaz, I'm your God. Think of the history and my involvement with the people of Judah. And you are my child. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. In other words, this sign that I'm asking you and in, in inviting you is something that can be immense, big, huge. And it's there for you, Ahaz, to authenticate my invisible power. That power that is far supreme of that of Assyria. Pay attention to me. But look at the response of Ahaz in the next verse. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. You know, Ahaz knows just enough scripture to be dangerous. And he takes a portion of scripture, do not put the Lord to the test, and he takes it totally out of context. And he says, that's forbidden. I can't do that. But wait a minute. God is saying, I invite you to ask for a sign. I'm extending my grace, my love to you. This is okay to ask for a sign. But did you catch those first few words of that verse? I will not ask. Ahaz was too proud. He could only wrap his head around something that was clear, visible, and that was the armies of Assyria. And he couldn't wrap his head around the invisible power of God. And we know what happened. I mean, Assyria did step in. Um, Israel and Syria, their armies taken care of, but it came with a price. And you know what the price was? Ahaz became a puppet king. Judah became a puppet nation to Assyria. And Assyria brought its cruelty, its violence, its degradation upon that people. And things would not be the same. If only 
Ahaz had trusted in God. If only he didn't rely on his own ingenuity. If only he had put his faith in the Lord. Now it's interesting to note that despite the fact that Ahaz made that decision, um, God did give them a sign. As God gives us a sign. You know, we may not be facing wars, but we have our own struggles, don't we? Our own sense of demons that kind of enter in and make like life dark. And the question is, will we trust God? Or our own cleverness? Will we be an Ahaz? That's the question. So God does give Ahaz a sign. And he gives it to him through the prophet Isaiah. And note in verse 13 these words. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David. You see, he makes a connection between David and, the, and or Ahaz and the house of David. Is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. Apparently, God knew that there was someone contemporary with Ahaz in the royal court, sexually mature but single, who would bear a son, whose name, can you believe it? Emmanuel, God with us. But Ahaz rejected it. He turned his back. But the sign, nevertheless, was there. Darkness encroached upon him, and darkness is what Ahaz received. Now, interestingly enough, this sign also is that amazing sign that we look to today, 800 years later. And it's a sign that certainly was true of that contemporary historical situation with Ahaz, but it points to the situation that took place that first century A.D. And it's recorded for us in Matthew chapter 1. And turn to it if you have it. It's on page 1 in the New Testament. You know, Joseph was one who faced his own darkness. It was encroaching on him as well. Much like the darkness was encroaching on Ahaz. Much like the darkness at times encroaches on us. You say, well, what was that darkness that he had to deal with? Well, Look at verse 20. But just when he, meaning Joseph, had resolved to do this, and we have to ask the question, well, what is this? What's the antecedent of this? And it's in the prior verse, and that was he was going to expose Mary. Why? Because she was pregnant. He was going to humiliate her because she was humiliating him. She was pregnant, and not by Joseph. This was before their marriage. And so, he was deciding in his head how to respond to this darkness. Would he trust God? Or would he be left to his own ingenuity? What would he do? And God intervenes. But just then he had resolved to do this. An angel of the Lord said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the next door neighbor. Does it say that? (laughs) No, no. No, it's from the Holy Spirit. You see, Mary was a virgin, she hadn't had sexual relations with any human, with any man. The seed that was in her womb was from God. 
And the angel was testifying to that fact. And verse 21 says, And she will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That was the mission of this child, this holy child. And to verify the authenticity of that mission, we'll read on in verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Mary was a virgin, had no sexual relations. The seed within her was from God. God is now with us. A prophecy written 800 years before had finally come to fruition. But would Joseph respond accordingly in faith? Just put yourself in his place. Embarrassment, ridicule. His mother talking about, now Joseph, why do that? Or believe God. He could wrap his head around the fact that she had a bump. But he couldn't necessarily wrap his head around the fact of the invisible power of God planting a seed within Mary's womb. But what did he do? He believed God. He trusted God. It says there in verse 24, when Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. As we face darkness that encroaches on our life, as we deal with the battles that we struggle with, how do we respond? We see how Ahaz responded. We see how Joseph responds. The religious leaders of the day, they had known the prophecies of the Messiah coming, but that was a threat. They'd lose their job, so to speak, or at least that's what they thought. Or here is the Roman government. This is an easy way to dispense with this Jesus and get him out of the way. What would they do to the darkness encroaching on them? Trust God or rely on their own understanding and eliminate the threat? And we know what they did. When you face your own struggles, and I know that we do here, When the battle of illness comes to our door and we have to deal with it, do we trust ourselves or do we put our faith in God? You know, we sing silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. But friends, there's nothing silent about the night. There's nothing calm about the night. When the darkness comes, when there's a financial problem and we don't know where to turn, or where there's a family member that has got difficulties and we don't know what to do, or when addiction comes, do we trust God? Or do we lean on our own understanding, our own ingenuity, Do we recognize Emmanuel, God's sign that things will be okay? Do we trust the words of our Lord that says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world give, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Do we believe the word where he says, I love you with an everlasting love? There's nothing you can do that will turn you away from me. 
I will never leave you nor forsake you. I forgive you. As Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Do we hear those words? Do we accept them? Or do we come up with our own plans? Do we listen to the clamoring? Jesus wants to bring silence to our night and calm to our hearts if we but trust him. He has come to us. There was a Persian king many centuries ago who had a deep, deep love for his subjects, for his nation. And he decided one day that he was going to go and see how they lived. And so he dressed up as a homeless person, a beggar. He went down through the streets. And a man who was quite poor himself looked out through the window and saw this man and invited him into his home. And there, the king greeted him, but he was unrecognizable. He ate his coarse food. He gave words of cheer. And then he said, thank you for your hospitality and left. And days later, he came back and he said, I am your king. I was here with you. And the man was overjoyed. And the king certainly thought that the man would ask for some kind of gift or favor. Because, of course, the king is here. Who wouldn't? But he didn't. And the king asked why. And he said, you know, others might ask for gifts or favor. But you left your palace and came to me like me and came into my home and ate my coarse food. You became like me. And friend, that is the greatest gift ever, that you have shared your presence with me. Friends, God has accommodated himself like in no other way as he has left his heavenly home and come to us in our darkness, in our addictions, in our loneliness, in our financial difficulties. Whatever the situation might be, he has come. In our darkness, will we lean on our own ingenuity or we will trust Emmanuel, our hope? Amen. At this time, we invite you to take your hymnal and turn to hymn number nine as we sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, or use the words on the screen. Let's stand as we sing. Let us pray our prayer of thanksgiving. Our gracious God, we want to thank you for who you are and what you mean to us. Thank you, God, for Christ's sacrifice on the cross and our forgiveness through his grace. 
as we begin this Advent journey, the beginning of a renewed commitment to our faith, we thank you for promise and Emmanuel, our hope, and we look forward to it with expectancy and faith. We pray for our nation and its leaders during these difficult times and for all those who are seeking to bring peace and justice to our dangerous and troubled world. We pray for the work of our deacons as they help people in our community with utility and rent needs. Those needs are so great. We pray for our session as they oversee the work of our church and our vision team as they work on a three to five year strategic plan. And Lord, let us pray for those who do not know Jesus. Be with those who are mentioned in our bulletin, especially Paulette Shields, Luca, who is Norma Jean Clark's grandson, Virginia Tinkin, Russ Royer, Terry Fryman, and Tony Allen Walters, and our homebound members. Also, we pray for the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, our youth, church staff, Sunday School, Logos, and our missionaries, Nick and Kina Costaluccio, and Tim and Kathy Holcomb, and our EPC cross-cultural workers, Sam and Krista, as they spread your word. We pray for the personal needs of the people in our congregation, financial concerns, concerns related to families and children, employment needs, and health issues. For we pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy come come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. And men and women, boys and girls, come from north and south, east and west, to sit at table with our Lord. And he invites each one of us who places our confidence and our trust in him as Lord and as Savior. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this, remembering me. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, remembering me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. And so we look back to that time in which Jesus gave of his very life for us, and we look ahead to that time in which we will see him in glory. And friends, that will be a glorious time. As you come forward today, please follow the direction of the elder. Come down the side aisles. Take a piece of the bread, then the cup. You may place the empty cup in the basket here before you. And then we do have angels here. And as is our custom on this Sunday, if there is someone that is close to you that you'd like to remember, who has gone on as part of that church triumphant, take an angel and come up and place it on one of the trees in front. As we might remember that in Hebrews 12, it says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and it is true, those who are in Christ Jesus, they're not dead, they're alive. And we are surrounded by them and the hope that Christ brings, that it is visible within them. So please avail yourself of that opportunity and then return to your seat.
the Christmas trees, and it is simply a reminder to us all. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And out of the darkness came light. And those who followed the light found life. Let's join together as we close our service by the singing of hymn number 29, Go Tell It on the Mountain. We invite you to come back for the celebration of ministry for Nikki Gilmore. And uh, please come back and share your greetings as we gather around the tables. And I am going to invite, at the conclusion of the benediction, uh, Nikki and her family to exit first so that they have a chance to be seated first, and then the rest of us can follow. And now go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Render to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing that his spirit goes with you. And may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance and give you his peace, both now and forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed another edition of God's Living Word, a program brought to you by First Presbyterian Church in downtown Greenville. If you're looking for a church home, we would love to invite you to come to our Sunday School Hour, which begins Sundays at 9.30, with morning worship to follow at 10.30. We're located in historic downtown Greenville at 114 East 4th Street, we can be reached at 937-548-3188. And if you're looking on the web, we're at www.greenvillepres.org. Throughout the week, we've got several ministries, small groups, Bible studies, along with youth and children's ministries on Wednesday afternoon and into the evening. There's something for everyone. And we do hope that you might consider First Presbyterian 
we would love to have you part of our worshiping community, whether it be in person or on our telecast Wednesday evenings. But until next time, may God's word dwell richly in your life. Goodbye from First Presbyterian.